Good afternoon, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this year's Bangkok Symposium. It's always a pleasure to be with all of you, uh, even though virtually, for the Bangkok Symposium. And uh, thank you for asking me to speak and share my thoughts on HIV infection in the next decade. Of course, we all know um, the remarkable successes of HIV treatment and prevention that has seen a market change in the HIV and AIDS landscape globally. Nevertheless, in our region, in the Asia and the Pacific, much work needs to be done in the next decade to catch up and to really achieve the 1990-90 goals that have been set globally. As you can see from this graph, we are a little behind in each of the treatment cascades um, and there is much work. Take, for instance, the first 90 HIV testing uh, again, uh, recent data shows that in Asia and the Pacific, key populations are most at risk for new HIV infections. Uh, however, HIV testing, which is the entry point for prevention and treatment, remains low and uh, averages about half in each of the key populations. And most and about half of key populations in our region do not know their HIV status. Then, Therefore, it is not surprising that late diagnosis in Asia and the Pacific remains the norm rather than um, an exception. So, what can we do uh, to address uh, these shortcomings in, in our region? We have, as you know, plenty of science and plenty of evidence which uh, leaves us to accelerate the uptake of this evidence to improve our HIV treatment cascade and as well as prevention intervention. Let's first of all look at uh, how we can improve the first 90, namely uh, HIV testing. Uh, this paper looks at the effects of HIV self-testing compared to standard HIV testing in the general population. With evidence from 14 randomized control trials and showed that basically HIV self testing doubles the uptake uh, of testing in the general population. It was also associated with uh, achieving high HIV positivity and linkage rates, and importantly, uh, was not associated with increase in self harm or suicide as has been feared initially. The WHO has increased, has uh, included HIV self-testing in their recent guidelines published in July of 2021. In addition to expanding HIV self-testing, the other important initiative in the next decade will have to be shifting current management of patients living with HIV or people living with HIV from a hospital or clinic-based setting to community-based setting where appropriate. This systematic review shows that decentralized and mobile testing strategies were successful in reaching younger and hard-to-reach populations. The use of community healthcare workers, whether they're peers or lay workers, and directly observed therapy show positive effects across the three treatment cascade targets, especially in lower and middle income country. Same day HIV testing and antiretroviral therapy initiation was also shown to improve retention in care and subsequent virologic suppression within these community-based models. And deployment of community health workers, peer and peer workers also significantly improved viral suppression. Task shifting to home visits, improved adherence, and finally, the use of technology and digital intervention increased the interventions and supplemented as the second and third 90 in the treatment cascade. So, more investment in community based HIV initiative in lower and upper and middle income countries is needed given uh, the success in many different models. In particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, but also, of course, uh, here in Thailand, where a key population-led health services, including uh, this one, from uh, involving transgender people, uh, have 
been shown, shown to be successful. Another successful model uh, from the Thai Red Cross Anonymous Clinic in Bangkok uh, showed that same-day antiretroviral therapy initiation is possible and uh, is associated with good retention in care, which was just recently published by Dr. Nitaya in the Journal of uh, in, in the GIS uh, Journal. And finally, um, the uh, next decade will surely see an increase in the use of uh, digital technology in all aspects of HIV treatment and prevention initiatives, from enhancing prevention messaging to uh, promotion of, of HIV self-testing, um, Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat have been shown to work well, uh, although uh, Facebook has, has been less successful. Other um, successful uh, results have been seen in increasing PrEP uptake through uh, education using digital technology and through increased motivation to use and uh, linkages to uh, PrEP services through digital technology. Refinement of big data algorithms for surveillance is another uh, important use of uh, digital technology as is linkage to care, adherence to medication and gamification to improve adherence. So I think um, just as uh, COVID-19 has accelerated the use of uh, digital technology in all aspects of medicine, uh, certainly uh, in the next decade of HIV treatment and prevention, we must do more to um, ensure that digital technology, particularly in a highly stigmatized environment um, uh, that we live in, can um, play a major role in, um, in increasing awareness, in improving HIV testing and linkages to care, as well as adherence to both PrEP and treatment. Moving on to um, antiretroviral treatment and prevention, I would like to spend a little bit of time in discussing um, new paradigms in HIV treatment. Uh, firstly, of course, um, simplification of both naive as well as uh, maintenance regime in the form of two drug uh, formulation, two drug regime. Uh, the uh, use of a combination of 3TC and dolatagruvia has now been included in both the um, EACS um, guidelines as well as the DHHS US guidelines as of last year. It has not uh, till now been included in the WHO guidelines. Well. Um, studies, uh, particularly the landmark Gemini, uh, study shows that initial two-drug regime showed, showed no difference in biological suppression and uh, no differential impact of low adherence for two-drug regime versus a three-drug regime. In switch studies, uh, namely Tango and SWOT, as well as the study which was uh, discussed at the July IS 2021, once again, uh, there was no major differences in the virology outcomes when switching from uh, three drug antiretroviral regime to um, the combination of dolatagruvia and 3TC in those who are uh, virally suppressed. Another advancement in antiretroviral anti treatment and prevention, of course, uh, the excitement around a new formulation, namely the long-acting injectables, in which there are now um, several coming into the market or at um, late phase of clinical trials. And here I summarize the different clinical trials for both um, treatment as well as prevention, utilizing long-acting injectables, uh, including cabotagravir and lanaprevir for treatment and cabotagravir for prevention. 
what uh, switch, for instance, of long-acting gametagravir in combination with viral piverine shows that there is non-inferiority, i.e. maintenance of biological suppression that was demonstrated in those who were switched to um, a combination of long-acting gametagravir and Piperine. Nevertheless, uh, much um, more research needs to be done in terms of uh, the use of long-acting uh, injectables, uh, feasibility and acceptance, particularly in, um, in our setting here, um, given that uh, many patients are comfortable with um, single dose, single pill uh, combination therapy. Uh, that's been widely available for many years. The role of long-acting uh, cabotegravir, um, which has recently been approved by the FDA, also warrants further uh, implementation research in its role in um, PrEP in different key populations. And certainly I think um, this has a potential to be a game changer for PrEP uh, in our region and globally. As we all know, much work needs to be done with PrEP that is now 10 years old in terms of uh, the confirmation of the success of PrEP in uh, several landmark studies uh, in New South Wales in Australia where uh, a PrEP scale-up has been taking place in the last five years, has recently shown a remarkable decline in um, new HIV diagnoses in both um, Australian-born as well as overseas-born uh, men who have sex with men. The impact has been higher in Australian-born men. And uh, overall, there was a, um, a remarkable decline in new HIV diagnoses in MSM in New South Wales, where, as you all know, um, the incidence of HIV has already uh, been uh, at very low levels in um, the last many years, thanks to um, scale-up of antiretroviral treatment, uh, in particular in Australia. As mentioned earlier, uh, despite uh, 10 years of uh, having very good evidence of the effectiveness of PrEP in different settings with large landmark uh, clinical trials, the adoption of PrEP uh, as a national policy and program um, has been somewhat uh, slow, although uh, thankfully we are starting to see an increase in, uh, across uh, the world region, as you can see in this bar graph here. Again, uh, Thailand leads the way with um, scale-up of PrEP in countries in, in ASEAN um, with this uh, Princess PrEP project uh, that utilizes same-day PrEP and uh, key population-led uh, services that have been to um, be effective in scaling up PrEP in Thailand. And uh, several programs are now underway to uh, expand this PrEP program nationally. What can we learn from the PrEP scale-up in Australia? What has been successful and how can we uh, improve PrEP scale-up in the next decade in our region and globally? Of course, um, local factors such as high-level political support with clear targets for reducing HIV um, have been um, sort of the, the uh, plan in Australia for, for a long while. Um, Australia is also blessed with a very uh, functional primary care system and um, surprisingly they were able to get generic PrEP at relatively low cost. Um, and I think one of the key uh, success factors in Australia is of course um, the very liter HIV literate mobilized and pragmatic gay community um, that have been uh, active since the beginning of the HIV epidemic in Australia. Uh, with these uh, factors, uh, it is not uh, surprising that PrEP is, um, uh, has been successful uh, in its rollout in Australia, that uh, many elements need to be um, 
emulated across the, the region. Of course, um, in, in countries where uh, MSM is highly stigmatized, um, this may not be um, as easily implemented as uh, it has been in Australia. To a large extent, uh, stigma and discrimination uh, has also been a major factor in um, the lack of adoption of uh, a highly effective uh, HIV prevention program amongst people who inject drugs, and that's um, methadone or, or uh, opiate agonist um, treatment, as well as needle syringe program, for which there are still many countries around the world um, where these uh, evidence-based prevention programs have not been adopted to scale. So the next decade also uh, means that we not only um, scale up and accelerate adoption of uh, all tools, sorry, of new tools such as um, PrEP and long-acting injectables and um, scale up further antiretroviral therapy and innovative testing measures, but also all tools such as um, harm reduction. Moving on to uh, management of uh, people living with HIV, um, success of antiretroviral therapy means that we have um, people aging with HIV, um, and unfortunately this uh, has been shown to be associated with multiple comorbidities, which adds to the complexity of managing um, our patients living with HIV. And these uh, comorbidities include cardiovascular disease, metabolic disorders, cancers, and mental health issues. What is important in the next uh, decade is uh, for us all to provide a person-centered approach to clinical care that not only looks at um, achieving and maintaining viral uh, suppression, but also making sure that we pay attention to the uh, multiple abilities that our patients are um, at risk from and to um, intervene in uh, modifiable um, risk factors such as host and lifestyle risk factors um, ART-related uh, side effects and uh, also uh, paying attention to access to care, as you all know, inequities um, and inequalities are major. In July of uh, last year, several of us were involved in a consensus statement that was published in Nature Communications that called for um, an expansion of our services to, to patients living with HIV beyond the attention that's put into HIV viral load suppression with um, patients living with HIV, living a longer, healthier life. Um, we drew attention to health systems in terms of um, providing patient-centered care that also um, looks at uh, issues with aging with HIV, frailty, and um, call upon integration of um, care that includes um, management of uh, non-communicable diseases, substance use, uh, mental health, uh, in addition to um, HIV treatment. And of course, um, stigma and discrimination, which still unfortunately um, remain a problem in many healthcare settings, must also be addressed. Lastly, um, despite the advances that we've seen in uh, HIV treatment, prevention, and uh, models of delivery of care that I have uh, attempted to summarize uh, just then, there are, of course, uh, many gaps that remain in our scientific knowledge and uh, in our armamentarium uh, to bring an end to AIDS. First of which is, of course, uh, we still need an HIV cure. And um, uh, it's uh, a little disheartening to see that um, the investment in HIV cure research has plateaued in the last three years, and we must do more to advocate for um, larger investment in HIV cure research 
as um, also in investment in um, HIV vaccine. As uh, we've all borne witness to in the last two years, um, hefty investment in COVID-19 research has led to a remarkable um, development and, of course, uh, delivery of uh, COVID-19 vaccine to billions of people around the world that has brought a turnaround in uh, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Although there's still um, some way to go, nonetheless, um, the, the ability to develop the vaccines uh, and deploy them in less than a year has been uh, nothing short of a modern medical miracle. But uh, that was only uh, able to be achieved through uh, amazing scientific collaboration uh, internationally, investment uh, from biotech companies and pharmaceuticals and uh, investment from governments as well as philanthropy that have brought us uh, to where we are with COVID-19 uh, vaccines. So there is much to be learned um, uh, from us in the HIV world from um, the uh, acceleration of COVID-19 research um, that we can adapt uh, to our own um, ongoing research so that the last few miles um, that we aim to uh, cover in order to end AIDS will become possible, whether it's in a cure for HIV or in HIV vaccine research. Of course, uh, in addition to um, biomedical science and research and implementation of what we already have, the Achilles heel of the HIV response that we must continue to work on is that of uh, stigma that remains rife in our region, as this chart from UNAIDS um, shows. And as we know, um, uh, overcoming stigma is uh, not easy. We've been trying to do that for the last four decades. But um, research in uh, stigma now tells us that um, there's no one size that fits all. And to be able to effectively uh, overcome stigma, uh, whether it's stigma towards people living with, with HIV or interse intersectional stigma um, towards people uh, who use drugs or, or uh, MSM or sex workers, the key um, thing is to um, have a, a program that's longitudinal. We know that single session interventions don't lead to lasting change, that uh, stigma interventions need to be multi-level and uh, in, in order to be sustained. And of course, it also has to have a multi-component um, model uh, to be effective. And finally, uh, what we know also drives stigma is, of course, the multiple policies and laws that continue to exist that impede our HIV response, laws that criminalize sex work, that criminalize drug use, uh, as well as same sex relations remain uh, in many countries uh, in our region. And the concern is, of course, a growing conservative political environment will not make it easy for us to advocate and to effect change in these laws.